Hello everyone. In this video from the Answers How To series, we'll discuss what is multilinear hardening plasticity model, how to calculate its properties from the experimental data, and how to use it in Answers Mechanical. Let's go. Here's a typical stress strain curve for metals under uniaxial tension. At the onset, they undergo linear elastic deformation where the stress developed in the material is directly proportional to the strain and the constant of proportionality or the slope of the curve is the Rang's modulus of the material. Once the stress developed in the material exceeds the limit, the response is no longer linear and this limit is known as the elastic limit. Before the elastic limit is reached, upon unloading, the material can return to its original state. If we further increase the applied load, the material starts developing plastic strain, meaning that if the part is unloaded, there is a permanent deformation developed in the material. It is important to remember that the material continues to undergo some elastic deformation beyond this point. The limit beyond which the material sustains plastic deformation is called as its yield strength. If we reapply the load, the stress strain response will follow the same path, but it will sustain new plastic deformation only after reaching the stress at which it was unloaded. In other words, its yield strength has increased due to strain hardening. Typically, metals follow a nonlinear response due to this hardening until nicking develops in the material. Beyond this point, the stiffness of the material drops down and eventually fails at a stress value which is nothing but its ultimate strength. In ANSYS Mechanical, we can model the strain hardening portion of the curve using either a bilinear or a multilinear hardening model. A bilinear hardening rule assumes a linear strain hardening portion and is defined using a tangent stiffness which is nothing but the slope of this line. A multilinear hardening model uses a piecewise linear function to model the nonlinear strain hardening response until the necking begins. So, it does not support the portion of the curve with negative slope. There are other material models available in ANSYS Mechanical that can capture the damage in the material, but multilinear model can only capture the response up to onset of necking. To define this behavior, we need to provide two sets of inputs. Linear elastic behavior, which is defined by Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, and multilinear hardening, which is defined by the plastic strain versus true stress, where the first data point indicates the onset of plastic deformation, which is nothing but zero comma yield strength. Now, one may ask, why we go through the trouble of inputting plastic strain versus stress instead of total strain versus stress? This allows us to define both effects independently, which is useful if we have different temperature dependent data sets for elastic modulus compared with plastic strain stress. If we defined total strain versus stress, we have redundant data point with elastic modulus at yield, and we cannot resolve the difference if values are inconsistent. Therefore, we separate material definition into elastic and plastic behaviors. The procedure for doing this is straightforward with a few simple calculations. I'll show you how to do this with real experimental data. Here's the data for a 316L stainless steel sample. The data is recorded from a uniaxial tension test. This data is engineering stress and strain and it must be converted to true stress and strain before we can separate it into elastic and plastic behaviors. This is because the engineering stress and strains are calculated based on the dimensions of the undeformed sample. However, as the strain increases, the area of cross-section of the sample reduces due to Poisson's effect. So, at higher strains, the engineering stress and strain deviates from the true stress and strain developed in the material. This difference may not be significant in the deformation ranges that we are interested in, 
but it's always a good practice to properly define the material input. The conversion from engineering stress and strain can be done using this set of equations, where sigma true and sigma engineering are true and engineering stresses, and epsilon true and epsilon engineering are true and engineering strains. Note that these equations are derived assuming incompressible behavior. For most practical cases, this assumption is not problematic, but it's worth keeping it in mind. Next, we must identify the point at which the material begins to yield. An easy way of doing this is to identify the point at which the response starts deviating from linear behavior. This can be done either visually or for better accuracy one may monitor the change in slope of the curve and then identify the point at which the curve starts to deviate from linear behavior. This point is nothing but the yield point. One can use the same strategy to identify the point at which the material may be undergoing necking. To do this, one may monitor the slope of the curve and check when it turns negative. That indicates where damage within the material becomes pronounced which is associated with nicking. Note that while there are damage models available in ANSYS Mechanical, they are outside of the scope of our present discussion. Next, we calculate the slope of the curve up to the yield point, which is nothing but the elastic or Young's modulus of the material. The next step would be to calculate plastic strain. This can be done by calculating the elastic strain at that point and subtracting it from the total strain. We do this at all the points in strain hardening region. The elastic strain is calculated from the ratio of stress at a given point to the Young's modulus. This is then subtracted from the total strain at that point and what's left is the plastic strain. A common mistake that users often make is to calculate elastic strain at the yield point and subtract that constant value of strain from the total stress strain curve. Elastic strain is not constant. It's increasing if the stress is increasing. Our data is ready now. Let's go back to the engineering data and see how to define linear elastic material properties as well as multilinear stress strain data. Open engineering data and make sure that the units are set to a system your data is measured in. In the table of engineering data, define new material. This only gives the name to the material that we will define next. Now, we need to define material properties for the new material. Insert isotropic elasticity from the toolbox and define Young's modulus as calculated previously. Poisson's ratio is another required material property for the linear elastic part of the material definition. Next, insert multilinear isotropic hardening to define plastic behavior. Before copying the data, make sure that the units for stress match your data. If everything looks good, go ahead and copy and paste the data. Note that the first point in this table should be zero plastic strain and stress at the yield point. The stress strain curve should be monotonically increasing. so. We must identify the region where it begins to dip down and discard that portion of the data. In other words, negative slope of the plastic strain stress curve is not allowed in the standard plasticity models. Now the material is completely defined and we can run the example in mechanical to show how to apply the new material in a simple analysis. In this example, we will simulate tensile test on a dog bone sample. The first step is to assign new material to the geometry. Under geometry, click on the part and define material assignment as new material. Since this is a non-linear analysis due to metal plasticity, we should turn on large deformation and auto time stepping under analysis settings and set initial substeps to 30, minimum to 30 and maximum substeps to 1000. This way, we can apply the load gradually and capture the elastic and plastic deformation of the material more accurately. Next, we 
will apply boundary conditions. On one end, the specimen is held at rest by the fixture, so a fixed support is applied. On the other end of the specimen, a displacement of 17.78 mm is applied. Now the model is set for solution. Let's hit the solve button. Let's plot the normal stress in Y and scope it to the name selection. Next, let's plot the total normal strain in Y direction. To do this, we'll use a user-defined result to plot. You can review the available options when you are on solution and change to worksheet view. We are interested in plotting the total plastic strain in Y direction. Select it, right click and insert a user defined result. While we are here, let's also insert an object to plot the total elastic and total plastic strains in Y direction. Next, select all of them and change the scoping to the nodal name selection. Let's define one final item before we evaluate these results. Insert a new user defined result and in the expression add EPELY plus EPPLY. By doing so, we're summing up the total elastic and plastic strains. So based on our discussion earlier, these quantities should add up to the total strain. Let's evaluate these results and see if that's what we'll get. As you can see, they correlate very well. So we can see that in the elastic region, the total strain is equal to the total elastic strain. But once plasticity sets in, it is a summation of both elastic and plastic strains. Also, note that the elastic strain continues to grow during plastic deformation as well. Finally, let's plot the normal stress as well as total normal strain at the node location. Select these two objects and insert a chart feature. Change the x-axis to maximum total strain and y-axis to maximum normal stress in y. Now let's plot this data against the experimental data we used. The simulated data correlates very well with the data we prepared for the input into engineering data. This serves as a verification to our input. Before we proceed to conclude the video, let's have an important discussion. The data that we input is discrete. So how does ANSYS handle calculations where we don't have the data defined? ANSYS uses linear interpolation for all calculations within the range of data defined. If the strain in the material exceeds the maximum plastic strain defined, then ANSYS does not extrapolate but it continues to use the last data point. In other words, the material behaves as perfectly plastic material beyond this point. So the user must exercise caution to check if the maximum plastic strain in the model exceeds this value, both in verifying the results or if the model runs into convergence or element distortion issues. In conclusion, the multilinear hardening plasticity model in ANSYS is defined using plastic strain versus true stress data. We extract this information from experimental data by first converting it to true stress and true strain, then identifying the point at which the material begins to yield. Once we do this, we can calculate the elastic properties of the curve using the elastic portion. We can then calculate the elastic strain developed in the material 
and subtract it from total strain to calculate the plastic strain. This is then input into ANSYS Mechanical to finish the material definition. Remember that the first data point should be 0, comma, heel strain. I hope that you have found this discussion useful. If you like this video, then please like, share and comment. Also, do subscribe to this channel to receive updates and visit ansys.com courses to discover more useful content.